brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village and Britain the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. So we're doing the Trojan War today, and it's um, our episode 16. And again, I want to send out a shout out to Marvine. I've also used some of the other um, resources for this particular episode. Actually, I've used quite a bit of resources. And if I name them all, it's going to be a rather long list. Um, the Trojan War and the various theories as to the actual mythology, the epic mythology of it, the logistics of it, um, the authorship of the Iliad um, uh, and whether or not it was a real geopolitical event or not is something that has been debated for as long as um, pretty much since Homer either did or did not write it. So in this episode, I'm going to leave a couple of things out um, of the discussion. I'm going to pretty much not talk much about um, Schliemann because that's what everybody talks about. And I think that's one of the, I mean, it's fantastic that he found uh, Troy and uh, I think that uh, in his own way, he did a lot for archaeology and the science of archaeology to inspire it. But I don't really want to go in the history of his search and what he did with it and the various follow-up debate. He found it, and that's great. Um, and the second thing I'm not going to really touch upon is the Homerian question, whether or not Homer actually was a real person or not. That's a whole separate literary, um, historiographic, and otherwise debate. That, so for the sake of this episode, we're just going to assume that there was some uh, sort of an individual called Homer that at some point in time had something to do with the writing of at least the Iliad and that this individual or representative individual anyway, uh, basically, can, the, the, the Iliad can be attributed to the authorship of such an individual. And we're going to leave the debate of his existence outside of the scope of this conversation. I would like to start with a quote, as I usually do. And this is the most, probably the most cliche quote from um, the Iliad, but it is just such a poignant quote and it's such a telling quote and it so much points out some of the subjects I want to touch on later that I cannot help but do what everybody else does. Um, now, of course, I'm sure everybody knows that the listeners back in um, Homer's time when this poem was originally uh, recited to uh, public, when they were listening to these words, they already knew how it was going to end and who was going to die and how they were going to die. So in this little episode, this is when Hector um, comes home from the battlefield and he's talking to his wife and his little son is brought into the room. In the same breath, shining Hector reached down for his son, but the boy recoiled, cringing against his nurse's full breast, screaming out at the sight of his own father terrified by the flashing bronze, the horsehair crest, the great ridge of the helmet nodding, bristling terror. So it struck his eyes. And his loving father laughed. His mother laughed as well. And glorious Hector, quickly lifting the helmet from his head, set it down on the ground, fiery in the sunlight. And raising his son, he kissed him and placed his son in the arms of his loving wife, Andromache pressed the child to her scented breast, smiling through her tears. Her husband noticed, and filled with pity now, Hector stroked her gently, trying to reassure her, repeating her name. And um, I, of course, I shortened this quote down a little bit. There's some pieces missing from it. But I think we can see from this little quotation that Hector, who is supposed to be the anti-hero, right? In the traditional reading of the Iliad, he's the anti-hero. In this part of the poem, is presented as a very human, very um, likable, very um, realistic character. This little detail is something that everybody who reads this poem is always struck by because it's the fear of a little child by the shining reflection of the helmet, by the horse hair on the, on the helmet, and the father's tenderness and understanding of his child's fear. Now, of course, when you're reading the, those words or hearing those words, you already know that uh, you know that Hector is going to be killed, that his son, uh, his infant son, is going to be tossed off the walls of Troy, his head smashed, that his uh, wife is going to be taken as a concubine by one, one of the victorious Greeks. And this whole scene is particularly touching because of that moment. 
So um, I, does everybody know basically the story of the Iliad or should I summarize real quick like ish? I'm just gonna run it through it just in case somebody who's watching this later on might not know the uh, story. So, um, as we all know, Zeus liked to bang everything that moved. Zeus was not very discriminate. And once upon a time, he was running after um, a young girl, a goddess, uh, a minor goddess, that his wife, Hera, was took as her particular ward and had a particular liking for. Well, uh, the minor goddess, uh, she refused Zeus's advances, and Zeus got very angry at her, and he said, and this goddess's name, by the way, was um, Thetis, Thetida in Greek, Thetis. Um, and she refused Zeus's advances, and so Zeus got angry. He said, oh, yeah, well, then you're never going to marry your equal. You're nev never going to marry another god. But Hera, who was very pleased at um, the fact that her mentee refused her husband's advances, she said, that's fine. She's going to marry the best of um, all mortals. And so she arranged for her a marriage with a you know, mortal hero uh, by the name of Peleus. Um, now, by this point in time, Zeus done found out that, that um, there was a prophecy that whatever child, uh, whatever, if this um, young goddess bears a child, this ch a son, he's going to basically kill and outdo his own father. And we all know that there was a familiar curse in the lineage of Zeus. They kept killing and castrating their fathers. Uh, Zeus was kind of very happy that he did not wind up getting involved with this young lady and that he did not wind up bearing a child who was going to do the same nasty thing to him, right? So he agreed, you know, to the wedding, and there was a huge big wedding, um, and of course all the gods and goddesses and all the minor spirits were invited, except for, of course, the one um, goddess, and this was the goddess of Discord. And this story is straight stolen in later uh, fairy tales, but of course the goddess of Discord, being offended by such neglect, she threw an apple on the table that just said the most beautiful on it. And of course all the goddesses got into it over whom, which one of them was supposed to have that apple. And the three of the greatest goddesses, of course, you know, uh, Zeus's wife, Hera, Zeus's own daughter, Athena, that he birthed himself from his uh, head, and Aphrodite as the most beautiful one, they decided it must have been one of them. Well, they couldn't decide among themselves, and none of the gods wanted to get involved in this particular decision-making because, um, you know, if you upset the uh, grand, you know, the king god's wife or daughter, um, that's not good. And if you upset Aphrodite, guess what she's going to take away from you if you happen to be a male deity, right? All joy of life for the rest of your existence. So um, they decided that somebody, a third party, should solve this particular argument. So they found uh, the most beautiful person alive at the time, male person. And this was a young prince by the name of Paris, who was at the time being a shepherd somewhere off in the woods. And so the three goddesses were whisked away. They flew away towards the young Paris, who was about 16 at this time and kind of hadn't seen a lot of women yet. And they demanded that he tells them which one of them is most beautiful. Well, Paris was shy at first, then he got unshy, and he asked the goddesses to undress. And they did. And, of course, Athena was promising him that, you know, if he chooses her, he will never see any failure in battle. He'll be the greatest commander ever. Uh, you know, Hera was promising to him that he would be the greatest, wisest, most successful ruler ever. Um, but who cares about all that when you're 16 and you have a bunch of naked women in front of you, right? So Aphrodite, of course, promised him the most beautiful woman in the world. And Paris got very interested, and he said, well, goddess, tell me, who is this most beautiful woman? And uh, Aphrodite said, well, you know, it's um, Helen. She's the wife of the Spartan king. And uh, Paris said, goddess, how can I marry a married woman? And, and goddess said, don't you worry about it. I, I got it taken care of. And so he chose, of course, he handed the apple to Aphrodite, and the other two goddesses decided that they absolutely hated Paris from this point on and they decided that they were going to destroy him. Now, Paris happened to be a prince of the city of Troy. And so from that point on, the goddesses, the other two goddesses united in their decision to wipe that city from the face of the planet. Now, fast forward, Helen, at this point in time, we all know the story of Helen. She was born from an egg. She had two brothers. They both were gods. She was a half god. She was beautiful. Uh, there was the big wedding. I'm just fast forwarding through this whole thing. Nobody could decide whom she should marry. Uh, so Odysseus suggested that, you know, all the suitors make a deal that whoever she chooses, all the other suitors would support him, always in, in every undertaking having to do with Helen. And she chose uh, the Spartan king Menelaus. Now, we remember that Sparta at this time was a pretty mellow place. This is not the later militant Sparta. This is a rich, soft, agricultural, wealthy 
um, Sparta. And so she married Menelaus, and Menelaus was the little brother of the big king by the name of Agamemnon, who happened to be the king of Mycenae. Um, and Mycenae, as we remember from the last episode, was the um, city that kind of was conquering all the other Greek city-states at that time. Long story short, Paris went to visit Menelaus. Uh, him and Helen ran away. Menelaus got upset, went crying to his big brother, and uh, his big brother, calling on the promise uh, that um, everybody made at the wedding, called all the other Greeks into a huge um, coalition. This sat under Troy for a long time. But, uh, according to the legend, it was 10 years. Um, it, it, there was some conditions required to be met in order for them to be able to take Troy. One of those was that Achilles was the greatest half-god um, Greek hero at the time, who was himself about 15 in the beginning of the siege, um, plus or minus. Um, Odysseus didn't want to go because he didn't want to leave his uh, pretty wife and his newborn son. Anyway, they all wound up at Troy. They sat there. Lots of things happened. Lots of people died. There was plagues. Um, there was epidemics. There was a lot of discord. Achilles got very mad at the leaders of the Greek army because he had a girl taken away from him, refused to fight. Uh, his best friend got killed as a result of that. Achilles finally agreed to fight, and uh, he wound up killing Hector, which of course meant his own death as according to prophecy. After which, according to the story, Odysseus came up with the wooden horse plan, and for some stupid reason, the Trojans dragged this uh, contraption inside their walls. Greeks jumped out, set everything on fire, everybody dies. Everybody on the Greek side tries to go home and pretty much dies except for Odysseus, who eventually makes it home after many, many long years. And of course, Nestor, who is the only of the Greek side that makes it home and lives happily ever after, though he was an old man at that point in time already. Um, kind of the end of the story. That's just a very quick summary of the legend. Um, I'm going to take a break so I can breathe for a second. Does anybody want to say anything else? I, I, I skipped a lot of details, by the way. It was a, vi a very cliff, note, cliff Notes version of the Trojan yeah. War, certainly. Yeah, definitely. So uh, what I want to do is, first of all, show you um, some of the um, treasures that were originally found. Maybe if I can make this work, if I can make this work. This is my little song now of the year. So some of the treasures that were found um, uh, at Troy, um, when Schliemann was excavating there, he dug way past the layer that uh, he was supposed to dig to, to find actual Trojan treasures of the time period that was appropriate. And he found a ton of gold. At Mycenae also a ton of gold was found. So this was a fairly wealthy time period for the Bronze um, Age cultures around that region. I've showed you some of these images before. This is known as the Mask of Agamemnon. It was found at Mycenae. And uh, it was just a burial mask of one of the nobles uh, who lived. Most likely it was Agamemnon's father or grandfather, they think. But it was uh, found in one of the burial tombs of one of the people who were living who died at Mycenae around that time period. Lots of gold. This is finds at Mycenae again. It was known as the Golden Mycenae for a reason. It was a very wealthy city. More gold. Lots of gold. More gold. This is some of the decorations of the various aspects of weaponry. And that's um, obviously a cup. That's obviously a handle of a, uh, of a sword. This was a Bronze Age, of course, and lots of swords. Um, the Greeks in particular were very warlike people at this time. This is uh, still the Achaean Greeks, the Mycenaean Greeks. Um, they were at war with each other all the time, and some city-states were more aggressive than others. So we know that we remember that Greeks were Indo-Europeans, right? And their language was Indo-European in, in, in essence. Well, who was on the other side of, of the Dardanelles? Well, it was also Indo-Europeans, and that would be the Hittite Empire um, that took a large part of that region. And that at that point in time dominated a large part of, part of that region. Let's see. Um, this is, uh, you know, in the poem, actually, I've mentioned this before, there's a description of the war task helmets that some of the uh, heroes wore. And um, this is an actual helmet that was found um, in Mycenae. Here's another version of a similar contraption. So these guys were actually wearing helmets like these because bronze being as soft a metal as it is, I mean, you can actually kind of defend yourself with the um, helmets of that type. And this is, of course, I've, I've had this outfit on before. This is what Helen most likely would have looked like because in, in Troy this, at, at that time, uh, and in Mycenae at that time in Sparta, you know, the fashionistas were following um, the Cretan style of dress and Cretan style of 
makeup. So most likely um, when uh, Menelaus finally got his wife back, this is what he was looking at, or something similar to this. There's a lot of questions to the story. Originally, before Schliemann found what is believed to be Troy, um, all the scholars believed that it was all basically a fantastical tale. It was an epic tale. Well, there are interesting aspects to the Iliad as such. Of course, Iliad does not describe the whole Trojan War. We know the story of the entire Trojan War because there are other poems from that cycle uh, and fra fragments of poems that survive. There are also references to later events in uh, the Iliad itself within the poem. And in the uh, Odyssey, of course, there's some references to what happened in um, the Trojan War as a whole. So we know the overall plot, just like the ancient Greek um, listener would have known the overall plot. But what is oftentimes not considered by modern listener or reader of this poem is that um, the Greeks themselves, the classical Greeks, considered Homer to be a very <clears throat> inappropriate, um, disrespectful towards gods and Greeks, um, author, because they, of course, believed that Homer was a single individual and a single author. And I want to kind of go a little bit into that before we get into the actual um, geopolitics of the Trojan War. So I kind of summarized the legend. Of course, in the legend, the gods appear on various sides. Some of the gods appear on the Trojan sides. Some of the gods appear on the Greek side. Some gods, like Zeus, are more or less neutral or undecided. The gods are portrayed very interestingly in this poem. If you just um, draw a picture of what the gods are like from this uh, poem alone, you will have a very <clears throat> interesting perspective of what the gods are like. So there are certain aspects to the poem. It comes, first of all, it has a lot of features of the original, very traditional epic poem. It's a genre that exists across the Balkans. It exists in Siberia. It exists in the Caucasus, um, in Asia Minor, near Asia, of course, in Slavic lands. And it is a, usually, it's a very archaic form of a story where you have a main character that is not quite human. And this would be our Achilles. An epic poem, an epic song as a genre has a very specific structure to it. You have a hero who is not quite human, who is greater than human and who is mighty. And his might is usually uh, shown through his wrath. This is a character who is greater and is equally dangerous to both foes and friends. Um, in traditional epic stories, um, the rulers, which in this case would be represented by Agamemnon, would try to keep the main epic hero kind of a little bit apart from the general population. When the, an epic hero gets upset, he is usually equally dangerous and deadly to um, both his side and enemy side. He does not distinguish the difference. And oftentimes he's so mighty that by his action, uh, he can uh, just cause more destruction than he intends to. For example, if he goes to drink, he might drink a river. If he goes to scream, he might kill a lot of people just with the echo of the sound. Um, if, you know, if he's having sex, he <laughs> pretty much has sex with everything surrounding, including cows, sheep, dogs, and so on and so forth. Exaggerated wrath, exaggerated loudness, exaggerated might is uh, usually what is primary characteristics of such a, uh, a character. And whom does the character usually fight, fight? Well, the character usually fights the other world, the afterlife, the underworld characters. And do we see signs of that in this original? If we were to break down the Iliad, do we see the signs of the fact that actually the Trojans in some way may be echoes of not actual real enemies, but some older, uh, very archaic epic story where um, the epic hero Achilles was fighting the underworld creatures, the forces of darkness. Well, there are certain indications to that. The King Priam, who is the king of Troy, is uh, described as an elderly king. This is not normal for uh, an epic story. Um, he is described as a, you know, he's so elderly that he cannot fight, but he has 50 sons and 50 daughters. Now, in real life, um, it's highly unlikely uh, for a ruler of that time to have that many offspring. The number of, hung, uh, of 50 and 50, the 100 offsprings, is usually something that is in indicative of a brood. And a brood is something that is, um, a serpentine or dragon-like creature would usually have. And of course, serpents are oftentimes associated with the afterlife and with death in this situation. So there's some um, mythologists who believe that the core of this epic story is a very archaic epic about this greater than life heroic character, such as Achilles, fighting against evil creatures of the underworld, and that the Trojans and Greeks were brought into the story later. 
And so this is a story that every Greek in Homer's times and even before would have known by heart. You know, it's a very simple story. Our guy, good guy, great hero goes, defeats the forces of the underworld. Woohoo, the end. Well, what they believe that Homer did, and this is why I personally do think that there might have been a single authorship, at least at the core of the Iliad, is that he took that very familiar to the Greeks a concept and he turned it into a political satire. If you think about the quote that I just read you right at the opening, the quote that describes the touching scene of Hector, who is supposed to be one of the princes of the land of the dead, one of the monsters, basically, how humanely he's described, how tenderly, tenderly, how lovingly he's described. Um, Homer throughout the poem repeatedly portrays the, the actions and the uh, personalities of the Trojan characters. And we got to remember that Homer was a Greek author. He was not a Trojan author but he repeatedly describes them as very human creatures. He makes them three-dimensional. He makes them very likable for the reader to the point to where the name Hector was fairly uh, popular in Greece itself. A lot of Greeks throughout history associated with these supposed enemies of the Greek people. Uh, the Trojans are very likable, they're very human. To where the Greek uh, characters are often, especially Achilles, is left to be that kind of a, a very two-dimensional, uh, almost cardboard cutout image of traditional epic hero. And what you get as a result is almost a satire to where Homer is not being very pa um, patriotic in his writing of this poem. He is not being very pro-Greek. If you take a close look, you know, if you ever have time and actually feel like even reading the synopsis of the poem, or if you have enough time to actually read the whole poem, you will see that the Greeks are left kind of, they're almost cartoonish. they almost um, cut out figures. And there's a possible indication that Homer's Iliad was not intended to be this heroic epic poem glorifying the deeds of the great Greeks, that it was a poem really written. It's kind of very similar to All is Quiet on the Western Front. Um, like a lot of pieces of writing, a lot of war movies today, a lot of war literature today on you know both East and West European and all, all around the world, really, ever since uh, the Homeric times uses the same kind of... Um, literary trick where they, instead of describing the entire conflict, they take a couple of days or a short, because the Iliad only describes a very short period of time within the actual Trojan War. It's just a couple of days uh, from the time when Achilles refuses to fight with the Greeks and do anything about the Greeks and sits out in his tent and sulks because his prize got taken away to pretty much the death and burial of Hector. Even though we already know that Troy is now going to fall, we already know that Achilles is going to die. None of that is described in the actual poem. But the same way modern works of literature that are anti-war use the same trick where they describe in great humane detail both sides of the conflict and the suffering of both sides of the conflict and the devastation that the war brings. Um, and there's a good indication that um, um, Homer himself, if there was such an individual, was most likely was a veteran of war. There are some um, mythologists and some literature uh, experts who analyzing the work find very graphic, very particular, and very anatomically corrections of physical combat and of kinds of wounds, of kinds of um, physical impact that particular fighting moves would make to another individual. And that would make sense if Homer himself has lived through a similar conflict. Definitely not that conflict. But there are some people who believe, and I kind of lean in that general direction, is that, you know, the Iliad may have been written as a not glorification of war, but an almost an anti-war um, work of literature or work of oral tradition. And there's some indication that that may be true because not much later, I mean, several centuries later, obviously, but there are other Greek authors who also go back to analyzing their own experiences in war. For example, their war with the Persians um, who step back from trying to sympathize with either side, even though they themselves have fought in an armed conflict and are trying to look at the devastation and the losses and the suffering that warfare brought to both sides. So that's not very um, unfeasible to think that Homer, whoever he may have been, may have had similar um, undertaking in mind. Now the Odyssey, of course, is a whole complete piece, uh, separate piece of writing. Um, a rather piece of oral tradition. It's written by in, in a different genre and completely, it's more of a fairy tale, really. It does not have any of that seriousness, any of that uh, graveness. It's, it's a great work in its own right, but there are some critics who believe it was written by a different author. And again, I lean in that general direction to where the Iliad is definitely written. It's very descriptive. It's very visceral. It's very emotionally appealing. And again, like I said, it almost leaves the Greeks looking like the buffoons 
and like the heartless invaders and the Trojans who are supposed to be the enemy. The enemy has been humanized. Okay, I'm going to stop and see if anybody has anything to say. No, um, I really appreciate uh, the perspective that you're sharing. And reading the Iliad, I've very, uh, very often felt the same way that the Trojan heroes are often, um, or, or the, and the heroes and uh, characters are very often made um, very, very humanized, very real. And you, know, you look at the rages of Ajax, and you look at the rages of Agamemnon, and you look at the rages of uh, Achilles, and like you said, almost, almost buffoonish. Um, uh, what you are saying about Homer, uh, perhaps being a veteran himself, and isn't Homer often uh, depicted or, or told of as being blind? He is, but modern day that these researchers almost uniformly agree to the fact that that was more or less um, a, a, euth a euthanism for for his uh, ability to see deeply into the core of things, almost no, none of the modern researchers believe that he actually was blind. That's up for debate. Sure, okay. But, um, you know, there was some, I have heard some discussions that if he was in fact a veteran and if he was in fact blind, there's a particular episode in the Iliad when I don't remember which character gets struck so hard his eyes fly out. Yes. I mean, such an injury is very likely in that kind of close, uh, you know, combat. Um, I mean, there's a, 50-50% he could have been blind, but uh, his physical, his visual descriptions are absolutely magnificent. They're just absolutely magnificent. And they lead one to believe that there's a possible, at least I, I have a feeling that it might have been a blind man who is recalling really bright visions um, of a time when he could see, but that's, modern researchers don't agree with that particular perspective at all. Yeah, well, and, and his, his depiction of essentially the, the, the body leaving the soul, or, or sorry, the, uh, the soul leaving the body, you know, the life leaving the body into this thing, um, are are incredible. Well, and what's what I think is really interesting, um, again, that you know, you know that um, Shakespeare, when he was writing all of his great works, none of his uh, plots are original, right? That Shakespeare's every single one of Shakespeare's great plays is a very well known, almost um, cliche, almost like so cliche that everybody got sick of it, kind of a story that was floating around, kind of a romance story, like a, I don't know, like a murder mystery that he took and suddenly put three-dimensionality into the characters like Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. He twist, almost twisted it around the meaning because there was an original Romeo and Juliet play that everybody knew it was just cliche, you know, kind of lovey-dovey, sexy, romantic, racy sort of story. And he took it and he turned it into a tragedy. Now, he didn't actually change any of the events that took place within that original plot line. But what he did is he put different motivations and he added more character to the individual characters within the play. I have a strong suspicion that Homer did something similar with a very traditional epic story. Um, and he contrasted the tradition. He left one half of the combatants as they were in the original epic story and then made the other half look human. And I don't know, to me, that contrast is very, very visible within the depiction of the characters. Yeah. And, and, and for the time, uh, the time being, that, that would have been a revela the, an innovation, if you will, in storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. And his depiction, another thing, you know, there, you can love or hate the movie Troy was uh, Brad Pitt. Um, but there's a couple of things they got right in there. I mean, first of all, uh, using the chariots as kind of a taxiing device is exactly what uh, Achaean Greeks would have been doing at this time, because uh, being in the Europeans, they couldn't live without their chariots, but their chariots were not very functional on the terrain they were currently occupying. So they did actually use their chariots mostly to just taxi their great heroes to the battlefield and back if they were still alive. Um, the other thing that they probably got um, right was... Um, the way, the way that they left the gods out of the movie. When they were, you know, the way the gods are portrayed in the Iliad, they are very uh, caricature characters. They are very, portrayed very disrespectfully. And it's something that later classical Greeks kind of had a problem with, with Homer, Homer's depiction of the gods. Because the gods, they're, they're buffoonish, they're cartoonish. They're very grotesque. They're very stupid. They're very petty. They're very childlike in a way. Um, they mature. That is not a, a way that you would portray deities that you revered yourself. I'm not sure. I mean, there's various different explanations for it, but it's almost like it's almost like the poem was written by an actual atheist or somebody with minimal faith in any sort of deity. And um, 
if he was somebody who came to question war, you know, of particular warfare that he was involved with. And now we got to remember that Homer was living, you know, towards the end of the dark ages of Greece when everything was kind of in chaos and turmoil. Um, I mean, people are oftentimes likely to get very disenchanted with deities at that point in time um, when everything is kind of dark and bleak around you. But it's definitely a satire on the gods, and that's something that even the Greeks themselves mentioned many, many times in a lot of references to this particular poem. Mm -hmm. And another thing I just want to say is there are some references in the, in, the, in the poem that are definitely, I mean, there's definitely aspects of this poem that is taken from oral history that harkens back to the period of the actual Trojan War. Now we're going to talk about whether or not it actually happened. But for example, the helmets that I showed you um, is something that is described in the Iliad and um, is something that was later found during the excavations. Um, there's certain um, types of armor. The, 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 the usage of chariots, for example, um, is likely authentic. Um, there are certain types of swords and armor that is the, now there's some anachronisms, of course, in the Iliad because Homer was partially mixing his own truth with, uh, you know, his contemporary reality with what um, he probably took from an older epic tradition. But because epic tradition is so um, is so constant, because there, you know, you um, Nathan, if you read the Iliad, you know, there's constant repetition in those formulas is what helps the reciter memorize that particular form of it because it's a rather long piece of. Um, Poem, poetry to recite. So those repetitions, you know, the swift-footed Achilles, you know, the golden uh, My Mycenae and other things like that, they constantly repeat it in a certain way. And the, that, and of course, the rhythm and the rhyme of the poetry itself, um, those pieces are really hard to move around. So there's parts of that poem that are most likely preserved from the original epic um, telling of it, and there are probably parts of it that were most likely reworked throughout the history of its repetition. And I suspect that there was an, another author who inserted some meaning on top of that original canvas, that framework. Now, we got to remember when we um, read today's um, Iliad, even if we read it in the Greek, that the original um, very archaic Greek at that time was actually a tonal language, and that their poetry also included the tonal changes. It's something that mostly in the European languages lost. I mean, English has some vestiges of it, because when we ask a question, you know, we kind of tend to go up a little bit, but most Indo-European languages have lost that tonal quality. But those, to those tonal variations also help with the flow of poetry. Now, um, I just want to show you some pictures because I keep forgetting to show you pictures, guys. So these, uh, you know, the Greeks themselves, they did, uh, depicted throughout their, you know, and these are from different time periods and different styles. But this subject was so popular among the Greeks and later among the uh, Romans. Um, this is the embassy to Achilles. Now, Achilles, of course, it was foretold to him that he had two choices when he was um, a young man, that he could either live a very happy life and die at an old age, happy and surrounded by family, or he could go and to fight, and if he went to fight at Troy, he would definitely die and die tragically and die very young, but he would be remembered for all time. And by the way, that prophecy is true, because guess what? We still remember who Achilles is, right? Well, his mother did not want him to die. She dressed him up as a girl, and he was a very pretty girl, and... Uh, uh, when an embassy of the Greeks was sent to this island to acquire the great hero, um, the Achilles is right here. He's in girl clothing. They couldn't tell which one of the pretty girls happened to be the great warrior Achilles. So Odysseus, who himself really didn't want to go to war and he was pretending to be mad, it took a trick to discover that he was actually quite sane. Um, so uh, Odysseus came up with a way to trick um, Achilles into showing himself. He, they brought a bunch of goods that they pretended to be merchants. They brought a bunch of makeup and girly stuff, and then they brought some daggers and weapons, and they kind of just laid them out on the tables. And of course, all the girls went, ah, and ran towards the girly stuff. And of course, Achilles was the only one who went to check out the weapons. So they, he was discovered that way and had to go to war. Um, this is just, uh, this is from the Odyssey, but this is just a description of kind of what the, the Greek transportation at the time looked. So we're talking about the face that launched the southern ships. We're talking about rather small um, ships with uh, no more than 50 warriors per ship. This is um, the girl that um, Briseis was her name. She was a girl. Uh, when the Greeks were on their way to Troy, they kind of pillaged and destroyed a lot of surrounding locations, and they happened to pillage a temple to Apollo and um, kidnapped the priest's daughter, and that caused the plague and the desolation in the Greek camp, according to the story. But there was a particular girl that... Um, Achilles was awarded, and this is a, a depiction of this girl, that he got really upset when she got taken away from him for the good of the whole Greek army. But there was one warrior in particular, and this um, Diomedes, uh, who was such an awesome and brave warrior. I was looking for a picture of that, but that he pretty much uh, was so upset that he wound up accidentally wounding Aphrodite on the battlefield, uh, which did not make Aphrodite very happy. 
this is um, an image of Hector, um, you know, having a helmet put on him. Um, this is, of course, Patroclus was, um, some say he was a lover of Achilles. A lot of people, when they talk about Patroclus, they depict him or think of him as a much younger man than Achilles was. That's not true. Uh, Patroclus was actually almost 10 years older, at least five years older than Achilles. He was actually his senior friend. Whether or not they were lovers was not significant. Um, Patroclus was not half as good a fighter because Achilles was half god and he was invincible, right? Well, Patroclus um, was not invincible, but he got so discouraged by his friends sitting it out and letting a bunch of Greek warriors die that he grabbed, um, you know, Achilles' army. He ran out on the battlefield and got himself accidentally killed by uh, Hector, which of course made um, Achilles very, very angry. This is some more images of Patroclus. It says right here, I can read Greek a little bit, it says Patroclus. Um, um, this is, so Achilles got very upset when his friend died. He ran out and he, uh, you know, immediately tried to slaughter. He decided that he wasn't mad anymore. He made peace with the Greeks. He went out and started screaming for Hector to come out. And of course, Hector came out. Achilles, being a, a, almost a god and invincible, I chased him around the city a bunch, cornered him, slaughtered him, tied his body to his chariot, and then proceeded to happily drag the body you know, and he's never in. By the way, Achilles let out a cry that was so horrible when he heard about the death of Patroclus and he went to go kill Hector that it actually killed a bunch of Trojans and killed a bunch of Greeks. So that's that element of the great epic hero. But anyway, he, uh, he acquired um, Hector. He dragged him around the um, city of Troy for a while in front of his family, of course, to their horror, and threw it to the dogs, but the dogs wouldn't eat it. There's another image of um, And he did not want to ransom the body to um, Hector's father. So be grieved Hector's father, um, elderly Priam. Um, he went and uh, pretty much begged Achilles on his knees. He snuck into the Greek camp at night and he begged Achilles on his knees to please let go of his son's body and allow him to decently bury, bury his oldest and his really only worthy son because Paris was kind of, I don't know, I'm not a fan of Paris. He was kind of a loser if you ask me. Um, and um, there's there's even a scene when Paris is supposed to early on when Paris is supposed to fight a duel a duel with a with Menelaus and he actually goes to fight the duel and then he kind of chickens out and Aphrodite whisks him away from the battlefield right into Helen's bed and Helen doesn't want to touch him she doesn't want to sleep with him because she's really disgusted with him and Aphrodite pulls her aside and says okay girl I promised you as a prize to Paris so you better sleep with him or else and of course Helen has no choice Helen really does not have much choice in this whole situation, according to the legend. Achilles, at one point in time, comes across um, an enemy that is uh, very great and mighty. And uh, he fights this enemy, and this is an unknown enemy, and he slays this enemy. And when he's slaying this enemy, uh, the enemy's helmet goes flying off. And of course, beautiful long hair is exposed. And it turns out to be that this is an Amazon queen who is uh, the leader of one of the local Amazon tribes. And Achilles falls, according to some of the legends, falls madly in love with her. Right as she's laying there, dying from his globe under his feet. That's the scene depicting that. This is the scene of Achilles, of course, being hit into his Achilles heel. And thank you, Dave, for finding this particular image. It's kind of unique. Of course, Achilles, when he gets killed, you know, there's a great battle over his body. Ajax, the greater, manages to kill. I think it's the greater, because there's two Ajaxes in the story. They fight over Achilles' body. They save Achilles' body. They're able to um, bury Achilles properly. I think this is another image of... Uh, Ajax carrying that Achilles out of the field. And uh, of course, uh, there was a girl that Achilles kind of liked among the Trojans. Well, later on, when the Greeks take Troy, they, um, they do a lot of wonderful things. They, of course, slay Priam. They rape all the women. Cassandra, who is, um, you know, the seer Cassandra, the one she, when she was younger, she, her, the Apollo kind of had a thing for her. And she said, okay, well, if you give me a gift, I'll sleep with you. And Apollo says, okay. And so she asks him, to give her the gift of foresight. Apollo gives her this gift and she says, nah, 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 nah. So Apollo makes it so that nobody believes that she sees everything true, but nobody will ever believe a word that she says. And so everybody thinks she's crazy, but she's running around telling everybody we're all gonna die, Troy's gonna fall, or no, no. Anyway, in the end of the whole thing with the um, Greek sack Troy, uh, she, she's uh, dedicated to Athena. We will talk about what Athena in Troy is versus Athena outside of Troy. But she runs to the altar of Athena, begging for protection. And Ajax, uh, I think the lesser, winds up chasing her down and basically raping her on the uh, steps of the Athena's altar. Um, that's another scene of the same um, story. And then she's taken, given as a concubine. Um, I don't remember to which one, one of the Greeks. Um, 
this is oh Menelaus and Helen. Menelaus being of course Helen's husband, he is you know breaks he kills her. Um, because when Paris gets killed, Paris eventually gets killed. You know uh, Helen marries his younger brother for a very short period of time, and so when Menelaus breaks into Troy, of course first he slays her second husband. And then he's chasing after um, Helen to try to kill her. And then he sees her beautiful white breasts and goes, um, maybe not. And he takes her back to Sparta with him and they live happily ever after. Um, they're some of the very few characters who actually have any sort of an afterlife, uh, any sort of a happy afterlife to the end of this whole story. Um, now, um, Achilles has a son who is, by some estimates, is about 10 years old when the when Troy is actually taken. I'm going to try, try to pronounce his name. It's Neoptolemus. Anyway, his wonderful and lovely son breaks in. His son is fantastic. First of all, he breaks into Troy. He kills everybody. He kills Hector's son. He um, rapes a bunch of women. He takes the girl that Achilles kind of liked, and he sacrifices her in a very bloody ritual on uh, Achilles'. Um, this is the scene of her being sacrificed in a very bloody ritual um, over Achilles' burial site. What is this? Uh, this is some more images of what happened to Helen after the war. Nothing happened to Helen after the war. She was happy. But she was half goddess herself. Ajax, the greater, um, after death of Achilles, things, because Achilles had very special armor. His mother being a goddess, she, craft, you know, she had some other gods craft some really awesome armor for Achilles. And of course, Ajax, who was the strongest warrior after Achilles in the Greek army, he thought that he should get this armor. Well, the rest of the Greeks decided that to award it to Odysseus. And Ajax got very, very angry at everyone. He uh, thought he was going to slaughter all the Greek leaders, wound up going a little crazy, slaughtering a bunch of bovines and other cattle. Um, when he finally realized what he has done, he was fairly embarrassed, so he wound up killing himself. And of course, you know, the Roman poem, Aeneid, that was much, much later commissioned by Augustus, uh, is based on the story because there is one character in the Trojan War, uh, of the, because everybody in Troy pretty much dies, was sold into slavery. But there's one character, and that's Aeneas, who, according to Trojan legends and much later Greek and uh, Roman interpretation, is so pious that he, and he's also half god, uh, he winds up carrying his elderly father out of uh, Troy and through the back gate. And he goes off and founds uh, what, according to the Romans, is going to be the Etruscans, more or less. And Romans later on um, trace their lineage, much later on, trace their lineage to the Trojan um, legend as well. So, was there or was there not a Trojan War? Personally, I'm inclined to say that there was, and I will explain to you why. Now, this shows you a little bit of a breakdown of what the station was like. Now, Troy, of course, is in modern day uh, Turkey, and this is where, you know, Hector Priam and all that stuff is. Now, note where Troy is placed right here. I mean, note its placement. Now, the Greeks would have come from all across this place. I mean, this right here lists some of the different characters, you know, that's where Achilles came from, Nestor, uh, the old, a very kind of, um, he liked to preach a lot. Even people from Crete came. Uh, now, this is not the Crete that we were talking about earlier. This is the Crete, um, uh, later Crete, Mycenaean Crete. But it, according to uh, Homer, at least, there was this great coalition of all these very um, dis diverse, dispersed, because Greeks never really united into a single state until almost modern times, really. I mean, or, un or unless they were occupied by somebody else. Uh, Greek city-states always had a very strong independence um, kind of tendency. So what would make them unite? And this right here, again, just gives you a little bit of a um, breakdown of which characters come from what parts, uh, what city-states. Over here, see all these little uh, locations, they're all different city-states, right? Now, here is, uh, where's my Troy? Troy is right here, yep. So now, Troy is, of course, on slightly different part of Asia Minor. It's in a different continent, really. What we have here with this line right here, is today's coastline. This is where the sea ends today. Now, back in the time of the Trojan War, the coastline would have gone to about here. Here's Troy. So this would have been a very comfortable, very safe place to, you know, park your ships and get pretty much up close to the city. Now, around them, they had very diverse, um, you know, uh, very plentiful lands. And when the Greeks came to attack, I mean, according to some interpretations, this is about where you know, the ships and so forth of um, the Greeks were stationed. They didn't even surround Troy as such. Um, so Trojans still had access to their allies. And Trojans had quite a lot of allies. I mean, they had a lot of allies from their uh, territory. And they also had allies from far away. Uh, there's some mention of, for example, the Amazon queen. 
which of course, when you have Amazons, you're talking about either Scythians or Sarmatians, which were the nomadic people of the steppes that we've talked about a little bit early on. And um, this is just a very standard picture of the um, excavations of Benin because Troy, you know, the site of Troy has many, 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 many layers, starting with very ancient, um, you know, almost bedrock um, territories to um, what is believed. Some believe that it was either Troy 7 or Troy 6.5, something like that, that Homer might have been talking about. That's still up for debate. Um, I don't think it's necessary to pinpoint. I mean, this site was taken many times and destroyed many times throughout its existence. It was definitely well fortified. And it existed, it predates the Homeric um, um, dates by far. And the dating of the Trojan War, I mean, um, I've heard anywhere from 1230 to 1160 plus or minus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1250, um, some of the dates. Um, but it, what, we need, what we need to keep in mind is that um, this is the very end of the Bronze Age um, global globalization. And right, this, this Trojan War, if it did happen, it happened right at the very end of the Bronze Age, um, at the heights of Bronze Age collapse. So the Trojan War would have happened right when that whole civilization, that globalized network of trade would have went down. What do I mean by globalized network? Okay. So what we have here, and this shows you kind of the uh, Bronze Age, um, you know, this is the collapse, the Bronze Age collapse, but if you look at it, so in the green we have Eumycenae in Greece, you know, the Hittite Empire, which was a huge empire at the time, we're going to talk about them pretty soon, uh, took up oh, this whole region. Now you see where Troy is. Of course, New Kingdom of Egypt, which was at its height, and it's never reached heights quite as high as this, was there were areas, and of course there was the Assyrian Empire, there was a bunch of other uh, local states that were happening around here. So all these the localities, they were involved in very heavy trade with each other. They were involved in very heavy diplomacy and warfare with each other. And at the time period when we're talking about really the Hittites, the um, uh, Egyptians, the Assyrians, the, everybody else around, they had a pretty established, pretty stable relationships. The Hittite Empire was right at its very gasp and it was about to go down really this whole reality was about to collapse now the mycenaean greece has uh, more or less relatively just wiped out crete and was at its at its own height and mycenae was attempting to unite all these people under its oversight and this is a time period where um Hittites moved in and took over troy now troy is known uh, also as ilium uh, vilium velusa in Hittite, uh, actual, uh, in their diplomatic archives, in their records, this uh, city is re referred to as Velusa. And there are actual references even to such an individual as um, a ruler of the city by the name of Alexander. Now, Paris's other name is Alexander. Uh, that's also the Greek tradition. So here's um, an interesting geopolitical um, theory that I come across and I, I tend to lean towards. Okay, I'm, I'm sharing screen, right? Right. Okay, so why would Greeks who were not very much, I mean, I don't think that we can believe the fact that kidnapping of somebody's wife would cause a whole bunch of little city-states to go to war, agreed? Seems kind of uh, overkill over a local issue to me, I guess. Well, and I, I agree so as well. So what I think may have happened here um, and this is not my theory. This is a theory of several researchers, uh, some of them from uh, Romania, some of them are from Russia, other Eastern European countries. I'm sure there's some Western dis discussions of, to that accord. Everybody agrees that the war most, most likely was over resources and geopolitics. Now, uh, with the Hittite Empire taking over uh, the Lusa, taking over Troy, if you look where Troy is located, it's located uh, right where, it's located right at the passage from the Black Sea to Greece, right? because you have um, impassable force here, you have mountains right here, more or less. Now, what was the main uh, aspect of the Bronze Age? Of course, it was the bronze. Now, in order to make bronze at this point in time, you had to have tin. The sources of tin were uh, in, in the Bronze Age and this whole region were very much, a, well, they were very much a mystery to the scientists up until about the 1980s because they couldn't figure out where these people were getting their tin because there were some tin sources on territory of um, Hittite Empire, but very, very small ones. The next most available um, area of um, tin would have been Afghanistan, which is further away, but those uh, sources got worn out pretty soon as well. Well, the next tin uh, source that they were able to excavate and actually find that there was actually 
people were mining tin there and acquiring tin there at the time that is very much in tune with the time roughly of when this whole story happened. It was actually on territory of modern day Kazakhstan. It would have been territory that was under the Scythians, the Scythian world, the nomadic peoples of the, of the steppes. And it is most likely that the Scythians, why did we have Scythians all of a sudden under the walls of Troy, protecting Troy, right? That's a big fat question. I mean, these are the, you know, the steppes people with their horses. Well, not only was Troy known for their horse trade in the ancient world, but there's a good chance that the only closest source of tin at that time was really in this, somewhere in this area, and that it traveled through the Scythian lands and under Scythian convoy, they even call it the European um, trade route, that there was a steady trade route established. And most likely they went around, because um, here we have very high mountains, right? Uh, that are fairly hard to tra uh, trustworthy. So there's a good chance that they went around this way to modern day peninsula of, of Crimea, and then was shipped because there's known uh, shipping routes from this area to this area, I mean, at that time, that was shipped via the Black Sea. And through the black and right through this narrow passage, it went to everybody else. So when the Hittites came in and seized control of this uh, sea passage, what they did, they essentially cut off um, the national security and strategic um, military resources of the Greeks. Because if you don't have access to tin and you are such a militarized people as the Greeks, Mycenaean Greeks were at that time, it would take you a couple of years before you would just be out of weapons. And now Hittite Empire at that time had fairly good, um, you know, they already had their war with Egypt. We'll go back and talk about it later on. They had a fairly good um, relationships with Egypt. They had fairly good rela relationships with the, you know, the Syrian Empire in this area. Um, Babylon was even rumored to be a distribution hub for tin, but they choked off the Greeks. And that, to me, seems to be like a valuable, you know, valid reason to unite together in such force and actually wage war on the city to take it back under Greek control, the very least to um, liberate it from the Hittite control to open up that trade route once again. And that's a theory that I find most likely, uh, more so than any other theories that I've heard out there. And I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say on the Trojan War. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and see if anybody has anything else to say. Um, the uh, theory about uh, them getting upset about being cut off from tin does make a lot of sense because I don't know exactly what their uh, iron and steel technology was, but tin is pretty valuable. They had no iron. At that point in time, the Hittites had monopoly on the iron, uh, and it was not the iron we know today. Um, and we will talk about that when we get to the Hittites. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Tin not coming in from Britain at this time in Cornwall in that area? Uh, it's, it's, I mean, some of it, yeah, but there's parts of it that is easier to, I mean, it's a question of, I mean, Britain at that time, you've got to think about what would it look like at that time. It was before it got shaped and, you know, kind of sheared. It was covered by pretty heavy forests. So I'm pretty sure transportation for Britain and colder seas would have been for the, for the Greeks a lot more complicated. I'm sure the Phoenicians did some of that, but then you're dependent on the Phoenicians. And this is a steady route that everybody have been used to for quite a while. Nathan, were you, were you going to say something? Yes. Um, well, so, so a number of things. Um, you know, you touched on who are the Trojans? Uh, were they Hittites? Um, no, they were not Hittites. They were what, what they were. They were a vassal state. So they were their own peoples. Uh, there's some debate about the ethnicity. The thing, the thing is, we have no written archives from Troy, but we have multiple references that Troy was a very, and for a long time has been a very wealthy trade city that was sitting in that sweet spot where it could control the trade and got rich and fat on it. And that's why it repeatedly got looted and sacked. Um, my suspicion is by the time of the, the events that Homer describes, there was probably multi-ethnic mixed population there. But majority of them most likely were in the Europeans of one sort or another. There's indication of the Luwite presence. Luwites, uh, they're a smallish kingdom that was a kind of allied with Hittites um, nearby. They were also the European speakers. Hittites, what they did is they basically offered vasseldom, you know, to put it in much more late, uh, you know, modern terms to the um, to the Trojans. They didn't conquer them. They didn't take them aggressively. They signed a treaty and they said basically. You guys help us out if we go to war, we control the trade, we protect you. What happened during the Trojan War, according to some researchers, is that because Hittite Empire was in turmoil itself and had a coup in the process, they didn't make it to Troy on time. 
They right. sent their allied forces. That's why there were all these allied tribes from around uh, under, that I mentioned in Iliad around Troy, fighting on Trojan side. But the main Hittite forces did not make it quite in time. And so Greeks were able to come in there, hit it and raid it before, you know, Hittite empire was able to regather itself, you know, pull its forces back to get, get uh, together and hit back. Right. Well, and, and you also speak of the, um, uh, the allies that the Trojans had, uh, the Amazons, and where were they located? Oh, they were located in Ukraine, more or less. In Ukraine. And there's also a count of Ethiopians, the king of Ethiopia, fighting for the Trojans. Egyptians. Egyptians, yeah. So I mean, because, because at that time, Hittites had close relationships with Egyptians. They were doing trade with all those people. Um, they were know. referred to as Ethiopians, but Egyptians, yeah. Right, but that's, it would be an Egyptian connection, I guess, would be. Uh, not, well, I, honestly, they were saying not. I, don't, I haven't looked into the Ethiopians, but I mean, what I'm saying is that, I mean, obviously, if they had connections with Egypt at that point, and we know that they were trading with Egypt, I don't see how much. Right, right. Pushed. Right, right. So, but, but uh, the point is, is that there, there were a lot of people who had a vested interest mm -hmm. in defending Troy. Right, because it was a coalition that took it, more or less. Yeah. That established, and they didn't even take it. The Hittites didn't take it. They established control, and they were, had favorable trade with their allies at the time. Right. And not, and I think that the Scythians, the Amazons, had a vested interest in protecting their trading route because they were the ones who were sending the tin overseas. Right. Right. And also, they were selling horses to Troy. Troy, Troy was known for its amazing horses, which they would have been getting from the steppes. <laughs> Anything else, Nathan? Um, the uh, well, and just uh, the, the final thing is, um, you mentioned that uh, the Trojan War. Uh, uh, coincides with the end of the, if you will, the, the, the high bronze age. Mm -hmm. And if there's a, if there's a correlation there. Well, I think, I think it's a symptom more than, um, it's, it was the swan song of the Hittite empire, really of that whole coalition of, you know, um, those old, old bronze age empires that kind of settled into a comfortable relationship after many, many wars with each other, you know, uh, the old kingdom of um, Egypt of, of the, you know, Assyrians, of Babylon and whatever function it was, they were, what caused the Bronze Age collapse, we'll talk about, but this was the, the, that last moment before the collapse, the swan song of that old world, before it went down, because at this point in time, the Hittite Empire was already kind of destabilizing. It was already starting to have internal turmoil. And uh, their grab for the, you know, for the tin trade may have been kind of the last desperate attempt to maintain control and to ma maintain their glory. Plus they ran out of risk, because originally Hittite had more or less monopoly on tin in that region because they had the only source of it. And that was, I think that was their attempt to kind of grasp for that former glory right before. It was literally like a couple of generations, if not a generation before the collapse. And another thing I forgot to mention is that the Greeks themselves, you know, and later Greeks, and even um, Homer, um, they talk about how the whole war in Troy, and also there's the second cycle of poems, and that's the Oedip Oedipus poems, was something that Zeus intentionally planned to get rid of all the, because you know, the Greeks believed in the age of heroes that ended at, was the Trojan War and the, the events of the, Oedip, uh, you know, the uh, Oedipian uh, cycle. That Zeus intentionally planned those two sets of tragic events to get rid of all the heroes because all the uh, Greek heroes returning from the uh, Trojan War that all died. All got killed by their wives or got boiled alive or, you know, just a couple of them made it out alive at all. All these half gods, they got killed. And, uh, you know, there's a good the reason to believe that this is kind of a reflection of the Greek understanding that their civilization that they vaguely remembered was kind of high and a lo lot more developed than it was in Homer's time, was about to plunge in that age of chaos. In other words, that that time of uh, plenty, the time of glorious heroes was just ended by Zeus. And that, that almost like an echo of that very collapse in the memory of the peoples who lost their writing during the uh, Dark Ages, who lost most of their history, but there was still some echoed memories there. Huh. So, um, so, 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 so almost a, um, a conflict between the gods and the heroes. Or, or almost a cleanup mission by the gods. Sure. Okay, if you guys have, I mean, if you're still interested, um, I can just tell you really quickly on the Trojan horse and the whole weirdness about the Trojan horse that nobody can ever comprehend about. So I mentioned about how there was an Athena. So you, it, Homer mentions it, and he, actually there's other mentions of there being an Athena that was worshipped by the Trojans. Well, what's interesting about the Athena that was worshipped by the Trojans, it was not the Athena uh, we have in Greece. And um, you know that the Athena's um, title, the Athena Pallada, I'm sure you've heard that before. 
The word palata comes from a word pala, pal, uh, palladium or palladius. I'm not sure how you would Englishize, Englishize it. Uh, palladium is uh, what it's called in uh, Russian, but um, it's an object that every um, Greek city, every Indo-European city seemed to have. It was a kind of a fetish of the city itself. Um, it was a, it's an object that we don't know what it looked like necessarily, but there's enough mentions of it in different cities around the, the Greek world and even the Hittite world and the Luwine world. Uh, it seemed to be believed that this is an object that was not man-made, that it fell from the sky. Um, and this object was a fetish of the city. It was kind of the spirit of the city. There's a mention in a Lesser Iliad. There's such a work as Lesser Iliad. of, um, And actually, I think there's a mention of it even uh, in main Iliad. I'm not sure if there is towards the end. But uh, that uh, Odysseus winds up sneaking into the city and stealing this particular object from the city. This object in this particular city was dedicated to Athena. Um, Again, the Trojan Athena, which was not, uh, it was not the goddess we can think of right now. She actually had a, it was a goddess with an owl's face. There are descriptions of this object and it seems to be, um, now, all these peoples, all these peoples involved in this war with, you know, the Hittites, the Luvites, the um, Mycenaeans, uh, the Trojans, they were all more or less in the European majority of them. And in the European tradition, there's a huge tradition of the horse, um, horse sacrifices. Um, Horses are very central to that to that tradition, and we know this. For example, in the legend of how Helen was uh, born in one egg with her two brothers, the Dioscuro brothers. Well, those Dioscuro brothers they're associated with an Indo-European tradition that is still, you know, well, relatively still alive in the Slavic tradition. For example, of the twin brothers of the two horse brothers, and there's actually it's a common embroidery and decorative motif when you have two horse heads and a woman between them. So it's the sister and the two brothers. If you ever heard of the bl black god and white god, or Chernobog and Belobog in Slavic tradition, they're the two reflections of each other. One is dark, one is light, and in between them is their sister slash wife. And it seems that Helen was that sister wife, and that, that that's a reflection of that same mythology in um, the Greek stories, the, the, the triplets, basically. Um, so there was a lot of horse mythology. You know, Poseidon himself was supposedly born as a horse. Um, there's a lot of horse mythology, and it is... In, in the European tradition, it is very common to sacrifice a horse on the death um, side of uh, any leader. And in the, uh, being in the Europeans, of course, the Achaeans also inherited that tradition. But, you know, being in Greece, horses were kind of scarce. And sacrificing a horse every time some leader dies, they had a lot of those leaders. You know, you'd run out of horses pretty fast. So eventually it turned to the point where rather than sacrificing, burying was the dead leader an actual horse, they would bury an image of a horse was the dead leader. And there's references in early texts about, for example, how in Athens there was a great statue of, <clears throat> I'm quoting Greek sources, a bronze wooden horse. I repeat, bronze wooden horse. And there's other references, um, beginning by early Greek authors, about how this bronze wooden horse was actually, um, it was kind of in a sarcophagus enclosure for um, traditional um, ancestor, mythological ancestor Pelopsis of all the Greeks, the very first Greeks, you know, Peloponnesian um, peninsula is named after Pelopsis, that this was some, somewhere where they would bury. So there seems to be some indication that early Greek leaders may have been buried in um, sarcophagi or in containers that were in, or urns or something that one way or another had some sort of uh, horse symbolism on it. And there's also reference to the fact that early um, Greeks tended to drag those relics with them when they went to war for good luck, the same way that Christian knights would do that during the Crusades. So in other words, if we're going to go and try to do war in a city, we're going to take the relics with our city's founder king, mythological heroic king with us for good luck. And that um, at the end of the war, if they were victorious, they would, um, you know, place that uh, particular receptacle um, in the, um, the area that they have conquered more or less. I mean, I'm kind of summarizing a very complex study, but there's a good indication that the Trojan horse may have been um, not a military device, but it might've been a ritual object that either A, the Greeks stole from Troy to begin with, because there's some associations between the Trojan Athena and the goddess Cabela. Cabela is a, there's a, in the European root, um, for example, Russian word Kabula, which is the word for female horse. Um, that it might have been a goddess that herself had a horse shape. And the, the, that palladium, that object that uh, Odysseus may have stolen, according to some legends from actual Troy, 
um, may have been actually potentially horse-shaped or horse-decorated statue uh, that was uh, central to the city that was also similarly the fetish or kind of like the heart of the city's um, ability to defend itself. And that, in, again, in Iliad, it mentioned that Athena got very upset about that and started punishing the Greeks and they tried to return it. So it's one of the, I mean, there's different subjects in it, but there's a good chance that the object, the Trojan horse, was actually a votive object that was either stolen from the city that uh, the Greeks were trying to return to the city, or it was a votive object, object that the Greek side brought with themselves. But in all actuality, whoever lived in Troy, whatever the ethnic composition of the population was, most likely spoke a language that was fairly close. And even Homer speaks about that in his Iliad, that they spoke a very similar language, but not identical. And they worshiped similar gods, but not exactly the same gods. That the traditions were still so close that they haven't diverged as far as they would later on. That these people not only had very similar cultural and religious traditions, but they also were almost able to understand each other quite well. But that's that's one of the theories on what the Trojan horse might have been. And to me, that seems a lot more feasible than any sort of um, you know, big bizarre contraption. And especially, you know, that would make sense of the story to me, at least this is my speculation, would make sense to why the Trojans might take that strange object back into their city. Because if a similar object was stolen from them and it was a ritual votive object, then they felt that the Greeks were trying to make amends or, you know, to appease the goddess by returning either that object or something to replace it. That would make sense as to why they would take it into the city. I mean, that's just one of the theories that is, to me is very interesting. Uh, that whole horse motif around all the Indo-Europeans who just love the horses any which way, this way and that way and upside down and in their meals and every other way too. All the way to the Vikings who like to eat horse meat with their rituals. But that was, yeah, that was the last little bit. Any comments, anyone? Absolutely wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, Hittites next Thursday, finally. I'm super excited to do Hittites who have been totally mistreated in popular culture. All right, well, thank you, everyone. It was awesome. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next Thursday. Thanks, thank Thursday. Always Thanks, a pleasure. Everyone. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye. Wow. that exist within every man's soul. Every man's and we will soul. live forever or as long as stories are told. Stories are told. Stories we are the are told. archetypes that exist within every man's soul.